Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. Richard Allinger, your television show's host uh, in uh, church in church history. Uh, I uh, have my mask on right now because uh, in the recent news releases, Michigan's Governor Gretchen uh, Whitmer has uh, made it mandatory that whenever we're out, we have to wear a mask, and if we're caught by the law enforcement agencies, we will be fined $500, and there is a possible uh, uh, be sentenced in jail if we do not uh, uh, comply to the governor's wishes. She is only trying to protect us from the coronavirus. Uh, I wanted to relate to you before I get into the church history content that I had uh, for Juneteenth last this last month. I want to uh, hope that you all celebrated Juneteenth with all of us uh, in uh, Flint. There, uh, there was news coverage uh, by the uh, major television networks, Fox News, even and CNN, that the two largest uh, Juneteenth rallies with thousands of people with their mask on, uh, social distancing of six feet, were rallying in Atlanta, Georgia, and Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it was, and then in Flint, Michigan, uh, we, we had uh, quite a successful Juneteenth march from the Burston Fieldhouse down uh, Saginaw Street to the City Hall for a rally, and then a lot of events took place at the Max Brandon uh, Park on Pasadena and DuPont Street uh, over by uh, Devil's Lake and the Moon Funeral Home, off that way. Uh, in Genesee County, there's only two lakes in this part of Genesee County where we're at in downtown Flint, and that is uh, Thread Lake, which is right around the corner uh, from the city hall, uh, out front of the Mount Olives Missionary Baptist Church. It's, you're right there at Thread Lake. And also Devil's Lake over by Moon Funeral Home. Them are the only two lakes in this part of Genesee County. And uh, to, 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 to go to any other lake, you'd almost have to go down by Fenton in that part of Genesee County. Cause, but right here by downtown, there's just Devil's Lake out there off of DuPont by Moon Funeral Home and uh, uh, Thread Lake, which is right down here by uh, the Mount of Olives Missionary Baptist Church downtown. Uh, when I went to Burston Field House, uh, I got there, uh, it really, it's rallying the cars. Everybody started pulling in around 4 o'clock, but I got there at 3 in the afternoon on June 19th to celebrate Juneteenth. So I had an extra hour, uh, and uh, so before the people all got there for the march down Saginaw Street to the City Hall, I went up by Bishop Floyd's church, New Jerusalem, uh, Bishop Sanders is now filling in for Bishop Floyd because the Lord came uh, and took Bishop Floyd home a few years back. And across the street from New Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church is the uh, Woods Fish Market. And I got the best tasting catfish at Woods Fish Market and uh, okra and french fries and coleslaw. And uh, I went back down to Burston Fieldhouse to get involved in the march. I got out of the car and started walking toward the, where everybody was parking their cars to see if I could find uh, our chair, the chairman of the Juneteenth committee, uh, Paul Herring. And uh, trying to find Paul, I bumped into 
our city's mayor, Mayor Neely, was there, and uh, he saw me eating that catfish, and I was telling him that I uh, had got that up to Woods Fish Market. And uh, he had his mask on, too, and I told him I heard on the news that only two states now in the whole union of the United States, that is Hawaii and South Dakota, are the only two states of America's 52 states that have not made Juneteenth a state a holiday. Uh, uh, and uh, so we're praying that Hawaii and South Dakota will uh, join with the other 50 uh, states and, and make Juneteenth the Day of Freedom, uh, Liberation Day, uh, African Passover, Afri uh, uh, American Independence Day, Juneteenth, Freedom Day, uh, uh, national observance by the president signing uh, the bill that has already went through Congress into law. Uh, we've been waiting for 20 years. We thought President Obama was going to sign it, but he didn't. Uh, so we can all get off on June 19th and be happy and celebrate that day like we do uh, the 4th of July. The, like we do uh, Martin Luther King Day uh, in January, celebrating his life and his legacy. Uh, and so, um, having uh, been uh, at uh, Woods Fish Market and Burston Fieldhouse, and also out to Max Brandon Park was Francis Gilchrist, the NAACP uh, president, and uh, the former uh, General Motors uh, UAW uh, arbitrator in the Office of Re Labor Relations and negotiator of contract UAW GM contracts, Eric's uh, first city uh, commissioner, uh, Eric Mays, was there, and a lot of UAW. Uh, Brothers and sisters were there at Max Brandon Park, and uh, there was also women set up at tables uh, registering voters. They want to even absentee ballots, helping Inez Brown down at the city clerk's office for uh, this very important uh, presidential election year that comes up in November of this year. And uh, with, with being at Woods Fish Market while I was waiting for the catfish to get cooked, a man told me after, because I had, I had, Paul, you have to read, I had this. Could you read that for me? Yeah, you can take off that mask, Richard. It's just you and I. I'm further than six feet away from you. You're oh, safe. Okay. We're good. Oh, okay. There you go. Oh, this is what I wore at the uh, right. Juneteenth just... celebration. Nice. All right, now, could you read this for me? I had my T-shirt on. It says, I joined the Juneteenth, I joined the village, Juneteenth, June 19th, African American Independence Day, Flint, Michigan, reflect and rejoice. Okay, and then the back, Mayor Neely really liked it. Flint, a great place to make better. SpectacleProductions.com, Flint, Michigan. And I had my uh, Juneteenth t-shirt on, my red USA hat, and uh, my red mask because of all of the different uh, safety precautions that we have to take. I think I even wore some uh, um, latex gloves. Uh, and Uh, let's uh, hope, as I was speaking to Mayor Neely, he was at the Juneteenth celebration too, uh, that the two states who have not yet made it a state holiday is Hawaii and uh, South Dakota, uh, and that they would make it a state holiday. And this man, when he saw my Juneteenth t-shirt, and I told him about it being passed by Congress, National Observance, June 19th, but it's been 20 years and no president has signed it into law yet. And he said, he told me uh, that, uh, well, Congress has a way, if the presidents won't sign it, to make it law themselves. 
There's some way Congress can do it without the president's signature, he said. They made law before like that. So maybe Juneteenth, uh, Freedom Day for 4 million Americans, uh, and Abraham Lincoln remembering that historic great event, uh, and uh, the two and a half years that people had to wait in Texas before, because it was, Texas was so far away out west back in Lincoln's administration, it took two and a half years for some of the Americans living in Texas to be freed. And that's what Juneteenth was about. And uh, so let's hope that uh, the two states of Hawaii and South Dakota make it a state holiday, then all 52 states are aboard now. And uh, that uh, if the president doesn't sign it, uh, that the Congress will go ahead and do some kind of uh, uh, unilateral act to make it law, because they've done that before without the president's approval. Uh, and then I've been getting tweets and uh, texts from Facebook people through the years because I'm on the Juneteenth committee. And one tweet tweeted me just recently, a woman. She says she's African American and she said she watched my YouTube uh, uh, podcast of church history and I was talking about Juneteenth. And uh, she said, you know, I've often wondered too what you said. Why has it taken 20 years? And she said... Because uh, I'm black and I love black history, uh, I'd like to see uh, that e uh, event memorialized in the minds and hearts and souls of America's people uh, by the president signing it. And could, could you tell me uh, why the president hasn't signed it? And I th then I thought, uh, possibly this might be the reason. I know Catherine Hunter Williams uh, and Dr. George Moss of the Kemet Study Groups here in Flint uh, told me that uh, like the Jews have their Passover on our calendar that they celebrate their Freedom Day because there was millions of them in slavery in Egypt and in Moses' ministry uh, he went down there with the power of uh, Jehovah, Yahweh and freed uh, millions of the Hebrew slaves who had been in bondage for 400 years. Uh, and because they really haven't made that a national holiday in our country, might be the reason that there's a hesitation on the part of the, the sitting president in the last 20 years to sign it into law because uh, it was uh, the African Americans were in the bondage of slavery for 250 years, four million of them. And when Abraham Lincoln uh, put the 13th Amendment through Congress and wrote the Emancipation of Proclamation, that freed uh, uh, four million Americans. And because Texas was so far away from Washington, D.C., it took two and a half years for that law, uh, the Emancipation of Proclamation, to actually be uh, enacted in Texas. And that's what June 19th is all about, and Freedom Day for all Americans, even those in Texas. Uh, and uh, also, I wanted to tell you that um, I uh, made a uh, I made a mistake on June's uh, of 2020's uh, program in church history by stating that NASA's space uh, program had uh, launched uh, the Dragon capsule on a rocket back in May amidst this COVID uh, pandemic and uh, had to get up to the speed of 1,700 miles per hour before it the Dragon uh, capsule could be released into orbit to dock with the International Space Station uh, with two astronauts in it uh, orbiting the Earth 300 miles above us and has been there up there uh, uh, for, uh, for, ever, for 20 years now. Uh, uh, ever since the year 2000, the International Space Station has had people up there working on scientific uh, experiments and so on uh, in zero gravity. 
uh, we're finding out a lot of things about ourselves uh, and uh, the universe now that we never knew before. And that's in keeping with Bible prophecy too. The Lord told Daniel uh, uh, hundreds of years before Christ uh, when Gabriel appeared to him when he was praying and fasting for three weeks uh, concerning his uh, city Jerusalem and his people Israel uh, and Gabriel said that men's knowledge will increase and they will go to and fro so this is in keeping with Bible prophecy that we become more knowledgeable as men and uh, so the correction I have to make is that I said that uh, the rocket was go was going with the dragon capsule to amount uh, to uh, rendezvous with the uh, International Space Station to dock with them it had to uh, attain a speed of 1,000 uh, well, 17,000 miles per hour but I misspoke myself uh, it's 1,700 miles per hour instead of 17,000 miles per hour and rocket scientists uh, have to uh, uh, take into their calculations when working on these rocket launches uh, to space uh, this one uh, 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 data byte of information. How fast, we talked about that rocket achieving the speed of 1,700 miles an hour in order to put the Dragon capsule into uh, orbit. Uh, and so this data byte of information they use in their calculation also. How fast does the Earth orbit the Sun? Earth spin, of course, is not the only motion we have in space. Our orbital speed around the Sun is about 67,000 miles per hour, according to uh, Cor uh, Cornell. We can calculate that with basic geometry. First, uh, we have to figure out how far Earth travels. Earth takes about 365 days to orbit the sun. The orbit is an eclipse or an ellipse, but to make the math simpler, let's say it's a circle. So Earth's orbit is the circumference of a circle. The distance from Earth to the sun, called an astronomical unit, is 92,955 uh, 1,807 miles. According to the International Astronomers Union, that is the radius, the circumference of a circle is equal to 2 times pi times the radius. So in one year, Earth travels about 584 million miles. Uh, at the speed of uh, 66,627 miles per hour. So the Earth is actually orbiting uh, the uh, oh, since speed is equal to the distance traveled over the time taken Earth speed is calculated by dividing 485 million miles by 365 days and dividing that result by 24 hours to get miles per hour or uh, that would be so Earth travels according to these calculations about 1.6 million miles at the speed uh, uh, Earth travels in its orbit up there 1.6 million miles a day or 66,627 miles per hour. So we are moving that fast right now, but we don't feel it with our feet on the ground. Uh, again, Earth travels, uh, so Earth travels about 1.6 million miles a day at the speed of 66,627 miles per hour. Now, the sun, our sun and galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, move too. 
The sun has an orbit of its own in the Milky Way. The sun is about 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. And the Milky Way is at least 100,000 light years across. We are thought to be about halfway out from the center according to uh, Stanford University. The sun and the solar system appear to be moving at 200 kilometers per second or at an average speed of 448,000 miles per hour. So now that I made that correction, I can go on now to church uh, history uh, content. But before I do, I, I have to uh, tell you and make this announcement. We, we don't know if the 14th annual prayer chain day event is actually going to uh, be executed in real time this year because of COVID, but it was scheduled. It's on Yom Kippur every year. So we knew last year in October when the, the 13th annual prayer chain day rally was over downtown on the front lawn of the city hall that uh, September 26, 2020 would be the next prayer chain day. But COVID happened, so we don't know if that rally is going to happen or not. But if they do have it in September, it's going to be on Saturday, September 26 at noon on the front lawn of the city hall, the prayer chain day. Now, if we do have it, we're all asked to wear red. And we have our T-shirts here. Now, Paul, could you read that for me? It says, Prayer Chain Day, praying for Flint, Michigan. And then the back of it, Paul, could you read it for me? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their lands. 2 Chronicles 7.14. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, that is out of the Old Testament, uh, uh, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We all wear those prayer chain day red t-shirts, and we wear red hats. Uh, and just be in prayer about that event. We, we don't know yet how it will be executed with COVID. Many churches now have canceled their summer camp meetings and vacation Bible schools because of COVID. So we'll just have to pray and leave it with, in the Lord's hands. Um, we believe as Christians that God is in control no matter what. And we do not lean upon our own understanding but we submit ourselves to him and the leading of his Holy Spirit. Now, with, re with regard to COVID, I got this letter from the Dr. John MacArthur of the Grace to You uh, website, gty.org -G website on the internet. Uh, and he said, Dear Dr. Allinger, uh, if there is one spiritual objective that the COVID-19 pandemic has accomplished, it's this. It has revealed what and whom people truly love. With daily life temporarily stripped of some of its comforts, distractions, entertainments, and freedoms, People are being given a rare glimpse of their own hearts, what they cherish, what they fear, and where they place their affections, trust, and hope. In short, they're being shown what they worship. Worship is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the church today, to the point that we've nearly lost uh, hold of the biblical meaning. Many Christians seem to think of worship merely as what happens once a week when they gather with their local congregations. For others, worship is some kind of inexpressible, intangible feeling or emotional high, an experience that happens to them. Music is often seen 
has a tool for propelling people into this state of euphoria. Music transfixes its hearers. Uh, the joyous transformative power of music evidences the importance of music in worship. We'll be right back after this. And so the king ordered his men into battle. And even though he was no longer acting in the rest interest, they followed obediently. But what if they didn't? What if they just refused? What if selfish leaders got no support? What if people had the courage to stand up when something wasn't right? What if the government didn't just serve a lucky few? What if it was designed and run for all the people, no matter what race, color, or creed? What if we didn't put up with anything less? What if? continue uh, with this letter from uh, Grace to You. Uh, Dr. John MacArthur uh, wrote me uh, and uh, he, he was saying that uh, uh, with regard to worship uh, is some kind of inexpressible in church uh, intangible feeling of emotional high and experience that happens to them. Music uh, is often seen as a tool for, for propelling people into this state of euphoria. Music uh, transfixes its uh, hearers. The joyous transform transformative power of music evidences the importance of music in worship. As a result, the endless debates and church splits over music styles are widely regarded as differences of opinion about worship. If you think of worship as a state of emotional ecstasy that happens to you rather than an expression of praise that involves both mind and heart, if your understanding of worship goes no deeper than your opinion on traditional versus contemporary church music, you haven't scratched the surface of what it truly means to worship the Lord. Biblical worship. Worship in spirit and truth is a constant, intentional, pervasive attitude. It's a persistent inclination of your heart and mind toward uh, the majesty and glory of the Lord. It's not a momentary event, but uh, a full-time, non-stop activity borne out in faithful praise, prayer, service, and study of God's truth. Furthermore, worship is not an optional byproduct of being a Christian. It is the primary purpose for which the Lord created and saved us. We're called to praise God and reflect his perfect righteous character. 
With all the turmoil and pandemic has created, the need is critical for genuine, profound worship. Worship that transcends the ups and downs of the new cycle, the new cycle, and the highs and lows of our emotions. Um, with regard to what Paul had written in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, uh, he included the graphic description of the perilous characteristics of the last days, not the church age since, uh, since the prophesied last days were still future when Paul was writing this letter to Timothy. Uh, not the church age since the prophesied last days were still future when he wrote of them in his last epistle, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 3. It is this warning concerning the religious leaders of the last days. They would observe the outward form, church buildings, sacraments, religious services of godliness, that is, religion, but would reject the supernatural aspect. They would desire the trappings of religious professionalism since they would be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now, on that note, because there are in uh, Christianity worldwide, there's a billion cat well, Catholics, when I say Catholics, that includes Roman Catholics, Byzantine Catholics, or Eastern Orthodox Catholics, and they had a split a thousand years ago. They're, they do not have a general consensus about doctrine, and that's why they've had a pretty pronounced split and a breakdown of dialogue over the last thirty uh, a thousand years. And, and then you have a billion, on the other hand, since the Protestant Reformation happened 500, ago, 500 years ago with Dr. Martin Luther launching the Protestant Reformation with his 95 theses or indictments against the Roman Catholic Church, being a Roman Catholic priest himself, uh, started the Protestant Reformation, and now we have a billion Protestants too. And it, it's not just the Roman Catholic Church uh, which is religious, and even the Protestant churches, which are religious, and, uh, that you're talking about two billion people, and they're they're. Let me tell you what it, you're you're looking at. The Roman Catholic Church, uh, the word Notre Dame, that is in English means Our Lady, uh, Sacred Heart, Holy Rosary, with regard to the mysteries of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then you remember like. Uh, these are uh, like call words, like when you hear uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, India, uh, or when you hear of St. Joseph or St. Patrick or Mother Teresa or St. Uh, Francis of Assisi. I was at St. Francis of Assisi Hospital down in Champlain, Illinois this, uh, in January with pneumonia. And uh, uh, you, you have... Um, Call words like the uh, patron saints of the uh, missions, uh, the the uh, Dominicans, the Franciscans, and the Carmelites, uh, the the Jesuits uh, of missions, and you have food dis uh, di food distribution and soup kitchens. This is worldwide with the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it might not be true with the Eastern Orthodox, Byzantine Catholics, and Protestant denominations, but. One thing about the Roman Catholic Church, they're big on food distribution all over the world and soup kitchens. And how is this upheld? It's upheld basically by um, a lot of volunteers in the Roman Catholic Church members being involved in that food distribution and soup kitchens and so on. And so this is uh, not only Catholicism, but the mainline Protestant denominations too, these call words like it may be amongst Protestant denominations, you'd hear the blessed apostles and the Heavenly Father's unconditional love for sinners. And uh, then you would, you'd have the, uh, st uh, the uh, um, statues and relics uh, of all these saints and 
Our Lady or Virgin Mary in these chur churches. These are uh, multi-million dollar cathedrals. Some of them are uh, over a thousand years old because uh, before the invention of uh, the telephone and radio and TV, people lived in villages and cities and towns and once a week everybody would go to church on Sunday and they'd go to these great big cathedrals and it seemed like with uh, robe choirs and big pipe organs, when you didn't have radio or TV, you'd go there and look at those stained glass windows and uh, sacred art icons and statues of all these different saints that they venerate uh, and it made them feel like they were uh, in another world, you know, and then they would be, their, their souls would be uplifted and then they would go back home and come back a week later. But uh, this still, you have these multi million dollar cathedrals uh, and also in Protestantism too, there are large uh, churches and um, uh, uh, you have uh, the uh, with the Roman Catholic monolithic whole of the Roman Catholic Church with a, a billion members, and remember I told you there's a billion Protestant uh, denominations of every stripe, a billion Protestants of every stripe uh, that's caught up into this religious uh, religious uh, um, attractions of the people to come to their buildings. But we're finding in COVID, religion is in relationship with the living God is more than just going to a building. And, 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 and they all work strategically, both Roman Catholic and Protestants, in collaboration, uh, implementing their programs with both. Now, COVID is kind of throwing a monkey wrench right now into all their programs with both, with, like I said, both in Protestant and uh, even in Jewish synagogues. And uh, in Roman Catholic churches, mostly volunteers. Uh, uh, with human resources and then financial resources. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church's new evangelism uh, that has uh, uh, changed how the Roman Catholic Church is now. Uh, it wasn't until like uh, around 1960 when JFK was assassinated, the Pope changed all the liturgy and polity in the Roman Catholic Church's services to, from Latin to English. And so that's what this new evangelism is, uh, is in the Roman Catholic Church, is to try to uh, uh, be more cultural appropriate, uh, attracting people uh, to their churches, Roman Catholic and Protestant alike. Uh, they say if you don't evangelize, you're going to uh, fossilize. And uh, both uh, Roman Catholic and Protestant denominations of every strike have, hosp stripe have hospitals, seminaries and schools and Bible colleges uh, uh, and so uh, just I was giving you a little bit of an idea of that uh, religious uh, practices and religion that uh, uh, this letter from grace to you was talking about dr. John MacArthur is part of the Reformation Network and the late dr. RC Sproles and this letter that they sent me uh, was saying, uh, now you know, such specific, I gave you the call words, and now you kind of know what it is. Uh, such specifications aptly describe the modern world of scientism and liberal theology, which pervades practically all religious denominations, Roman Catholic and Protestant, and overlaps with all kinds of liberal not to, in, even in Islam and uh, in Jewish religions, uh, their uh, Judaism, they're kind of toward liberal uh, uh, doctrine too. Uh, and it says, uh, it, it's all changing now to become more culturally appropriate. Uh, practically all religious denominations uh, and overlaps with all kinds of liberal social movements. Uh, although these uh, are widely diverse in structure and purpose, they all share one vital feature in common. They reject supernatural Christianity, uh, especially literal creationism. Many liberal preachers give nominal allegiance to the teachings of Christ and the Bible with all their call words they use, like uh, the Father's unconditional love for all sinners, 
and uh, but they invariably deny the mighty power of God the Father in special creation as well as the great worldwide miracles of the Bible. Uh, really, a gospel without miracles is no gospel at all. The flood, the dispersion of uh, all tongues of people at the Tower of Babel, uh, delivering the millions of Hebrew slaves out of bondage, uh, with the Passover miracle and the splitting of the Red Sea uh, are all being uh, uh, deleted out and the supernatural miracles are being de deleted out of all these different uh, teachings in the churches now and their uh, seminaries. This prophecy is not given in scripture simply has a matter of information. It contains a warning urgently needed uh, by Bible believing Christians again he's talking about 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 uh, it contains a warning urgently needed by Bible believing Christians who are under pressure today to compromise with humanistic liberals on the great doctrine of God's create God the Father's creative power many have accepted the evolutionary system of the ages, geo uh, the ages of geology, and this is tragic and dangerous. Instead of compromising with evolutionary naturalists and religious liberals, has many evangelicals today, both Protestant and uh, Roman Catholicism, and in Eastern Orthodox Byzantine Catholics, are today uh, the evangelicals today are inclined to do. And Paul has warned them that uh, they sh uh, should be alert to this. And, and, and if uh, they're going that way, before they get too far off track, they need to come back. And that's why my book, that's what the Reformation cannot be over, because we need uh, the church, all of us, uh, Protestant denominations and Roman Catholicism, since Christ was here with his apostles delivering the gospel, uh, have gotten off track and reform means we need to get back to what it, it really is and uh, so when, when you look at that uh, you're 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 looking at also with this condition of the church you're looking at the indifference to doctrine and this is part of the indictment of not only the billion Roman Catholics but this is an indictment the indi their indifference to doctrine is uh, 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 an indictment to the billion Protestants as well as the billion Roman Catholics. Uh, now, as far as the word doctrine goes, uh, it appears 57 times in the Old Testament and New Testament. The word doctrine appears uh, 57 times in, in uh, the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, and... Uh, uh, in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, chapter 32, verse 2, it says, My doctrine shall drop like rain. My speech shall distill as the dew upon the tender herb and has showers upon the grass. And then uh, in uh, 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 Mark, chapter 11, verse 18, it says, and I have to get my magnifying glass. And the scribes and chief priests heard and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because... All the people was astonished by his doctrine. And then John chapter 7 verse 16 says, Then Jesus answered them, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So, uh, that's what doctrine is. It's 57 times doctrine occurs in the Bible. And so, let's look a little bit about this one indictment against the Roman Catholic Church 
in the modern emerging church of Roman Catholicism, even in their new evangelism, and uh, Protestantism with their over 2,000 different denominations uh, of every stripe. Uh, this is an indictment for both the Roman Catholic and the Protestant churches right now in the modern emerging church. They're indifference to doctrine. Uh, the proper study uh, of doctrine is not easy. It takes time, a lot of hard work, and much prayer. For those reasons, many people don't study doctrine. Others don't study doctrine because they think it is just, a, is just for professionals. And even some pastors don't study doctrine because they think it is just for scholars. Still, there are others who don't study doctrine because they are indifferent to it. They are content with being fed milk and knowing only the basics of the basics of the faith, but they are largely apathetic to pursuing the doctrinal meat of the faith. I find it hard to tolerate this kind of indifference in myself and in others. Christians' indifference when it comes to what we believe is deplorable. For, for how can we be indifferent to those vital truths that can save or damn our souls? Has one Puritan pastor said, indifference is the mother of heresy. If we become indifferent about doctrine, we will soon become indifferent about scriptures and eventually indifferent about God. In 1929, Gershom Machen uh, left the once doctrinally sound Princeton Theological Seminary to help establish the Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Machen uh, and the men who had left with him departed not simply because of Princeton's liberal theological drift uh, away from orthodoxy and not simply because its uh, faculty denied certain historic confessional doctrines. They left Princeton fundamentally because of the growing lack of regard for doctrine itself. Indifferentism. Indifferentism about doctrine makes no heroes of the faith. Machen wrote, if knowing doctrine doesn't matter, then nothing really matters. We live in a culture that often promotes indifference, and many churches have subscribed to this indifference because they argue doctrine is dif difficult, doctrine isn't attractional, and doctrine divides, it's true. Doctrine does divide true Christians from false Christians, but doctrine also unites because of the Spirit of God, the orthodox confessional doctrines of Scripture alone can unite a bunch of wretched sinners so that we might have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 5. In many cases, people are indifferent to doctrine because they have been taught how to study the Bible. They, they, have, they have not been taught how to study the Bible or because they have been taught by those who have misunderstood important doctrines. But many in the church do not understand biblical doctrines simply because they have never really studied them. If the church is to understand and confess sound doctrine, reject unbiblical doctrines, and dispose of unbiblical presuppositions and doctrinal misunderstandings, we must begin by repenting of our indifference to doctrine. Without sound doctrine, we are doomed. So that was the letter that was sent to me from uh, gty.org, grace to you.org, Dr. John MacArthur. And uh, now in the way of the Roman Catholicism that I was talking to you about, I have this book in my research of church history called The New Dictionary of Theology. The new, the new Dictionary of Theology. Uh, it's edited by Sinclair Ferguson and David Wright and J.I. Packer. And I found in this book, oh, and by the way, uh, Dr. Sproles and Dr. Uh, 
John MacArthur have their own, this is a Reformation Study Bible, edited by our, doc, the late Dr. R.C. Sproul's Old Testament, New Testament, and this is the MacArthur Study Bible, large print edition, uh, Old Testament, New Testament too. And uh, this book I've had on other programs, The Truths We Confess, a systematic exposition of the Westminster Confession of Faith by Dr. R.C. Sproul's too. Uh, so, now, th with these books, and even John MacArthur has given us, to celebrate his 50 years of ministry in the Reformation Network, this hymnal, uh, uh, Hymns of Grace, hundreds of hymns of great, great Christian hymns of grace. Uh, so, and, you know, Dr. Uh, Sproul's passed away a couple years ago. He is 78 years old. He couldn't breathe at his last. And Dr. MacArthur's over 80 years old now, so he... Uh, probably is going to be going home with the Lord pretty soon, but they've done a lot of work here because the Reformation is generational. It's a continuing movement, like Juneteenth is continuing a movement. The prayer chain day is a continuing movement. Uh, and so that's what the Reformation is. It's a movement, and uh, it's generational. After we're lo no longer here, it will continue to go on. Uh, so in this theology, uh, th uh, this uh, new dictionary of theology, I have found in my research the Roman Catholic the uh, what Roman Catholic theology could, with regard to help us understand doctrine a little bit better, because most people in the Protestant and uh, Catholic uh, uh, churches are not they're indifferent toward doctrine, uh, and that's an indictment against them. So we need to reform ourselves or get back to what we need to be doing. And so Roman Catholic theology to understand this, uh, different schools of theology arose very early in the church, but it remained essential. Uh, let me just say this too. Uh, the other non Christian religions like Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism, they have different schools of sex or theology in their own religions too. So Christianity has a lot of sex too, just like all the other non Christian religions do. You know, Shiite and Sunni, so on. Uh, uh, Roman Catholic theology, different schools of theology arose very early in the church. But it remained essentially united for a thousand years despite schisms, heresies, and bitter controversies. During this period of prominence of the see in Rome steadily increased, that's the papacy, its authoritarian claims were well advanced by the uh, uh, 14th century, and certain doctrinal emphasis became increasingly clear. In other words, that 14th century was around the time Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It is only with the division between the Eastern and the Western churches, remember I told you the Byzantine Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Byzantine Catholics, Eastern and Western churches formalized, uh, had their split in 1054, the Great Schism. Uh, that we can speak more precisely of a Roman Catholic theology. The 16th century rift with Protestantism uh, at the Reformation sharpened its distinctions. Roman Catholic theology is so comprehensive that it cannot be easily summarized. So I just wanted to go to the Theological Dictionary and to read to you uh, in the last uh, minute of this uh, session uh, the definition of papacy and uh, Mariology, because that's part of the Roman Catholic doctrine that uh, the Protestants and the Eastern Orthodox have trouble with, uh, and that's uh, like uh, papal, papal decrees and Mariology, uh, the, uh, the Immaculate Conception, uh, the Assumption of Mary, because uh, Elijah and uh, Enoch went up to heaven too, and they assumed Virgin Mary did too, but Enoch and Elijah's bodies separated from their soul uh, and dropped down to the earth to be resurrected uh, by Christ at his second return. Whereas the Assumption of Mary, they, the Roman Catholics say that she actually went up to heaven in her body, but uh, no flesh and blood can go there. So that Assumption doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church is not scriptural, and it's why we have these splits with Protestants. Now, the papacy, the Vatican II uh, Constitution, uh, the church declares the Roman pontiff has the successor of Peter, is the perpetual and visible source uh, and foundation of the unity 
of the bishops and the multitude of the faithful. And then in the last three or four seconds, I'll just read to you what the theological dictionary says of Mary. Mary, or Mariology, the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mary, is a classic example of gradual developments of doctrine uh, from the 19th century to the development of the accelerated, uh, stimulated by uh, uh, the uh, infallible, quote, infallible uh, decrees of the Pope uh, with regard to who they call Our Lady or Notre Dame, Our Lady, uh, actually uh, has a co-redemptrix of Christ, and they pray to her, uh, and I'm going to close with this. I want you to look at this verse, because this is a Bible verse that uh, says that there's only one mediator between man and God, Paul, I can't see this. Could you read this for me in the last second? Sure. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And the Pope has made Mary a mediator too. So I'll get back with you on what all this means uh, in the next uh, session. So this is your friend Dr. Allender saying...